Welcome everyone to today's Connect and Learn on educational equity sponsored by Social Venture Partners. We're delighted today to have Jamila Prince-Stewart and Sabira Gordon uh, as our guest speakers who are leading the statewide campaign to pass legislation aimed at reducing the school spending disparities across the state. While Connecticut is often cited as having one of the best educational systems in the country, our learning outcome disparities by income, race, and special needs are among the worst in the country. These disparities were further exasperated during the pandemic with test scores for students declining in math and English. A big driver of this problem is the lower school funding provided to Connecticut's urban school districts that serve lower income and racially diverse students and students who are English language learners or have special needs. Today, you'll hear about the plan to address these issues that is currently under consideration by the state legislature. We'll start with presentations from Sabira and Jamila, who will share with us the current challenges in school spending in Connecticut and how the proposed legislation can help address this. And then after their presentations, we'll take questions from every from the participants here and also share how you can help out. Today's session is the February installment of our monthly Connect and Learn series organized by SVP on key topics of interest in addressing opportunity gaps and the racial wealth gap in our state. I wanna thank Marjorie Almansi and Camille Guthrie for organizing these sessions. Uh, we're happy to share that our March session, which will take place on March 7th at noon, will feature Carol Shattuck, the Executive Director of Food Rescue, to talk about the food insecurity problem in Connecticut. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Jamila is the Executive Director of Faith Acts for Education. Faith Acts is a faith-based educational advocacy organization in Bridgeport, Hartford, and New Haven that builds relationships, leaders, and power through community organizing and civic engagement. Faith Acts is 80 churches, 500 members, 5,000 committed voters, and 11,000 congregates strong, and those numbers might be lower than kind of what they are now. But um, in addition, we're really proud that Jamila serves as the board chair for Social Venture Partners, where we directly benefit from her tremendous experience and insights. Jamila is a native of New Haven, Connecticut, a graduate of Yale University. After graduation, Jamila started her career at Hartford Youth Scholars Foundation, where she placed inner city middle school students into independent secondary schools around the country, recognizing larger systemic issues facing Connecticut's education system, Jamila embarked on a journey to increase the participation of community leaders, parents, and people of color in Connecticut's education reform movement as the director of community engagement at CONCAN, uh, which you'll hear about more in a second from, from Sabira. Um, during her time at CONCAN, Jamila began a, be, began a robust clergy organizing effort that garnered major wins for Connecticut's education reform movement and then she went on to found Faith Acts for Education. Subira Gordon is the executive director of CONCAN, the statewide education reform organization that has worked since 2005 to increase education opportunities for our students with the greatest impact. CONCAN is leading an advocacy movement to ensure that all kids have access to high quality education, regardless of their address. And I'm happy to say Sabira is also a member of Social Venture Partners and active in our work in Waterbury, where she lives. Just to give you a few uh, background details on Sabira, Sabira was born and raised in Jamaica in a small rural community with a 2% literacy rate. Her mother was one of the few people who could read and Sabira quickly realized the value of schooling and her mother was often asked to assist neighbors with undertakings that required more than a first grade education. Upon graduating from high school, Sabira attended Bates College, where she earned a bachelor's degree in history and spent years afterwards organizing workers in Connecticut to advocate for their rights. This was her passageway to political mobilization, policy change, and the legislative process, culminating with her role as executive director of the Connecticut General Assembly's Commission on Equity and Opportunity, 
Uh, at the Capitol, Sabira worked closely with grassroots advocates and legislators to create equitable solutions for communities of color. Since joining CONCAN, Subira has led numerous legislative victories, uh, including minority teacher recruitment and retention, education funding reform, and working to ensure that Connecticut's education system is responsive to the students, to the needs of students now and in the future. Now I'd like to turn it to Sabira and Jamila uh, for their presentations. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to share my screen, Sabera. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll kick us off and get us started. Thank you, Mark, for that overview. And welcome, everyone, to this presentation. Um, <clears throat> Connecticut is an interesting state. I think as Mark said, you know, we we uh, we're often cited as having one of the best education systems in the country, but that is only true if you are from a certain zip code and you are not in one of the 30 lowest performing districts in our state, which happen to have the majority of kids and specifically kids of color. Um we have been, so Jamila and myself, we're part of the Education Justice Now Coalition, and we've been working on this effort. Well, there have been people in the state who have been working on this effort for over a decade. But the Education Justice Now Coalition started this effort, I want to say in the summer of 2020, really trying to figure out how we're going to address the large racial funding gap that Connecticut has. And um and what we were gonna do in the short term to address some of one of the long-term systemic issues, but those that were just made um, even greater and worse by COVID. Um, next slide, Jamila. If, if we think about what are, the coalition has been working on this issue, but there are essentially five pillars for like the drastic problems that are we're facing right now. And these are the NAEP scores that came out last year just really showed Connecticut dropped significantly. Um, we went down overall about eight points for English and math, but what's not in this slide and what the real story is, is that for kids of color, it was significantly worse. For English language learners and for students with special needs, we dropped to about, for English language learners, we're about 48th in the country. And for black and brown students, we are, are the gap between our white students and black and brown students got bigger with the last um, test scores. Also what's coming up is the federal funding in Connecticut is running out in 2025. And Connecticut got a huge investment of federal resources to um, help mitigate some of the learning loss and ensure that our state, our students were supported during COVID. And those funds are running out at the end of 2025. And what we're looking to do is infuse um, some to infuse resources to ensure that we don't hit that hit that fiscal cliff. And we've seen that lots of districts have been spending that federal money specifically on essential services, educators, behavioral techs, and really trying to figure out how they can help our students get ahead. The other issue is chronic absenteeism. In many districts in Connecticut right now, over 50% of kids are chronically absent, and that's our large cities. So in Bridgeport, in Waterbury, in New Haven, in Hartford, there are some schools in Hartford where 69% of kids are chronically absent. And what that means is they have missed 18 or more days of school. And that's a direct pipeline to truancy and essentially, you know, figuring out how we can stop these youth from being connected to youth violence or um, really figuring out how we can connect connect and keep them engaged in school. And as many of you know, there's a teacher shortage. Like Connecticut, like many states, are faced with these drastic teacher shortages that are coming. And we really want to make sure that we're able to help districts uh, support um, hiring of teachers, but specifically making sure that the teacher workforce is more reflective of the, of the student population. So ensuring that we have a more diverse workforce that's connected to the students that they're serving. And then, you know, recently we heard that Lego was leaving Connecticut due, due to a workforce shortage. We have lots of, we need to figure out how we can get kids to and through college, but we also need to figure out how we can help young people get access to workforce development um, programs. And many, I think um, by the end of this year, specifically, we know that most jobs in Connecticut will require some higher level of education. Even though it's not college, we do need to make sure young people who graduate from high school are able to go on and figure out what they're going to do with their life and being connected to workforce. So those are the main reasons, kind of the big pillars for why funding reform. 
Um, I think I'll just take this. I pull it back to my personal story. I'm a mom of two kids who are, who live in Waterbury and attend school in Waterbury. Waterbury is one of those cities that's chronically underfunded. In Waterbury, Black students, 30% of Black boys are on track in ELA or math in the city of Waterbury. That for me is a tragic problem that so many families are facing. If you think about what that means, it means that 70% of kids are not, will not read on grade level by third grade. And we know that, you know, the United States, they figure out how many jail cells are gonna, they're going to build based on whether or not students are reading by third grade. So that's like one of the chronic, that's one of the main indicators about a student's success in their life. And we are, I mean, I'm personally working on this because I want my kid and every kid that looks like them in the city that we live in to be able to have access to a great education system, the one that is cited as a second or third in the country, as we know that Connecticut is able to provide. So the policy that we're working on this year is um, HB 5003. Jamila, do you want to add anything there before I move on? Good. Okay. Um, so the policy that we're working on this year is House Bill 5003. And as I said, um, Connecticut has $639 million fund, racial funding gap between districts with majority white students and all other school districts. And the solution that we're working on this year is House Bill 5003. And it essentially does uh, four things. It fully funds the education cost sharing grant, which, which is the way that we fund education in Connecticut. Connecticut has 11 different funding formulas, and it's based on your school type and not based on your student need. So what we're doing is we are funding students based on their learning needs and we fully fund public schools of choice, which are um, charter schools, magnet schools, and vocational agricultural schools. And we're reducing Connecticut's racial funding gap. It doesn't, it does not close the gap because of the way that Connecticut's fund, Connecticut funds education with a portion of the funding comes from property taxes and a portion of it comes from the state. So we're not able to, to close the gap completely, but we're able to reduce that gap by about half through this funding proposal. And essentially, what we're doing is we are delivering on the promise to low-income students and poor students and students of color that Connecticut does care about you. We do want you to have the best education in the country, and we know that this policy will make a difference. Our coalition is broad. We have over 60-plus organizations who have signed on to support this. We have the support of the business community. We have CBIA. We have mayors. We have the, um, the Connecticut Educator, Educator Association Teachers Union who have signed on because this is transformational policy to allow school districts to be able to fund students based on their need. And we are getting out of the business of what we've been doing in Connecticut is pitting school type against school type. So magnet schools have to go to the legislature and fight for their funding. Charter schools have to go to the legislature and fight for their funding. We're equalizing the way that students are funded so we can talk about generally education and education funding rather than each individual school type needing to have this in this conversation. So I will pause there and then I'll kick it over to Jamila. Thanks, Sabira. Um, so I just wanted to go back to, to some points that Sabira made, and we're going to um, wrap this up soon because we want to leave the majority of time for like questions and conversations. Um, we presented to you all on this issue before. Many of you um, in your um, professional and personal walks of life, you know the story just as well as we do of the deep inequity in this state. Um, but um, for folks who aren't as familiar with our education funding system and how many students we serve, um, we just want to paint a very clear picture for you. So as um, Sabera said, you know, Connecticut is ranked number th um, three in the, in the country in, in terms of education. Um, we serve the student population the size of LA Unified School District, right? Like one school district in California, um, and we've divided those kids up 169 plus times, right? So I, I talked to a, a board member. We're both a part of, you know, a national education landscape where we're connected to a lot of folks around the country and hearing about other things going on. And I, I'm in a cohort with one board member for one school board of LA Unified School District, and we have 169 plus here in Connecticut. And we know many of us who are from here and live here um, that the, the division of Connecticut is overwhelmingly based on race and on class, right? You can live in the state in the North and like really not interact with people who don't look like you um, on a normal basis. And so that third ranking um, is a lie, right? Like it's not the experience of many people in the state. And so when you disaggregate the data, we're not just saying that like, 
our black, brown, and low-income kids aren't doing as well as their white peers in the state. We're saying that when you look at the country, like we are doing the worst with that population of students and we are one of the wealthiest states in the country, right? So there are 22 states, um, as Sabira mentioned, that are outperforming us. And in particular, this one really hits home, especially if you're um, like a black family who lives here, whose family migrated here from the South. A black student in Mississippi currently is getting a better education than a black student in Connecticut. And that's no dig at Mississippi, but that should be shameful for this state, especially with the resources that we have. Um, we also know that the inequity runs deep um, in between districts. So um, in Bridgeport and Fairfield, um, that's a $6,000 difference per kid in terms of what we're spending on education. And so as Sabira laid out, um, there's a huge challenge and an opportunity right now. We don't like to just base this on the economy and on numbers because we're talking about real people's lives. And we'll talk about that a bit more in, in the beginning. But if you're just looking at this purely from an economic standpoint um, of how we're going to continue to um, you know, survive after the impacts of the pandemic, the influx of federal dollars were never intended to sustain us. Um, those are one-time dollars that are about to sunset and run out. Um, and so what will happen is that if we don't speed up the implementation of these funds, what we're gonna see is a huge drop off and intense resources being placed in high needs communities and an immediate drop off of those funds. Um, we also know that um, the reality is, is that we have a surplus. So I'll tell you, like I was in a meeting in New Haven last night with pastors and educators and a lot of educators who work in alternative schools, um, in the city and you know what they said is like it literally makes them sick to their stomach to see um, the headlines about how well our economy is because if you go into New Hallville in New Haven um, that's not the experience of folks they are suffering they're still hungry right like that mutual aid and those gift cards and those you know like um, trucks filled with foods and groceries those things have run out but people's experiences are no different um, as Sabira mentioned like there is a teacher shortage, but there has been a teacher shortage in our urban communities. Um, urban uh, districts can't compete um, where towns that have smaller classroom sizes and less um, student needs are paying um, a lot more money in terms of teacher salary, right? And so like there are schools in New Haven where they literally are being taught by substitute teachers for an entire year that happened to a member of my family. And there's also a school in New Haven where they have moved all of the seventh and eighth graders out of the school into different schools. Um, there's also schools in New Haven where 100 kids, um, you know, throughout the year are coming out of juvenile detention centers and just being put back into those school systems and there's no social worker in those schools. So those are some of the realities that folks are dealing with. Um, so when we look at our bill, this has been a long arc and a journey um, towards equity, um, but we're all, if you look at the, the line of where we're at, like we've come far, but even after this, as Sabira said, this does not eliminate the racial funding gap, it closes it significantly, and there's a long way to go after this. Um, but just in terms of my story on this issue, I started working at CONCAN in 2011. Um, we had a very similar hearing on a very similar bill back then. So that is how long I alone have been working um, on this fight. And some of you on this call that I see have been working on it for even longer. Um, so we, we had a hearing that year, it got nowhere. For so many years, it was like, there's not enough money, there's not enough money. Um, and then in 2017, um, there was an important bill passed um, that uh, increased funding for districts. Um, but the challenge was is that that funding wasn't equitably placed across um, all types of public schools and it was phased in. Um, so what we did is that in 2020, um, in um, the height of the beginning of the pandemic, we came back together and said like, we gotta work on closing this racial funding gap. So over the past three years before now, um, this coalition that Sabera and I are a part of and are leading, like we've worked to change some key things. We increase um, the weights for concentrated poverty. Um, we also increase the weights for English language learners. And we're also getting those weights equitably distributed across um, different types of 
uh, public schools, charters and magnets, right? So the places in which we see our low income students, um, our black and brown students in both urban and rural settings, we're making sure that they get the resources that they need. Um, so I'm a bottom line you, how much does our bill cost? It costs $270 million. And to be um, very clear again, like what we're doing is like the current law that exists, we're just asking to speed it up a few years so that it coincides with when the federal dollar sunset in fiscal year 2025. Um, for, I know we have folks from everywhere on the call, but what does this mean for specific districts? This is 21 million additional dollars for New Haven Public Schools, and it's um, about 23 million for Hartford, and it's about 3.5 million for Bridgeport. Now, our largest base is in Bridgeport, so why is Jamila advocating for a bill that only gives this amount of resources to Bridgeport? We are working on that, and we've had a huge challenge, and this is why not just state-level politics matter, but local politics and advocacy matter too, because what has been happening is in the city of Bridgeport, Bridgeport has been under um, counting their free and reduced price lunch students. In a city like Bridgeport, New Haven, and Hartford, once you re reach a certain threshold of students that qualify for free and reduced price lunch, the entire district um, is eligible for free and reduced price lunch. So what was happening in Bridgeport is they stopped counting. And so like their count um, is about 60-ish percent free and reduced price lunch students compared to about 85% that we're seeing in New Haven and in Hartford. Um, they also are experiencing some declining enrollment. And to be clear, those students aren't just all going to um, magnet schools and charter schools. We're really literally trying to figure out where the students are going. Um, and if you, sorry, if you fix that number and they more accurately count their free and reduced price lunch students, that gets you, that will get them closer to 14 million. Um, so the previous superintendent was like, the numbers aren't wrong. We're now working with the current board of ed and the superintendent um, to make sure that those numbers are correct. And that's not an issue of our bill. That's an issue of the fact that the formula is based on these counts and they're not counting the right amount of students. So we're working with them to fix that. Um, for magnet schools, so a lot of folks um, like, well, what is it, you know, what is this giving to traditional public schools versus schools of choice? Um, so in that 275 million, um, 25 million is going to magnets and 21 million is going to charters. Um, and so you're not seeing a significant amount being taken away from traditional public schools to be given to schools of choice. This is about equity for all schools, regardless of the type of school. Um, last point is just who has the power to give this to us. Um, we know the data. We know that we're right. We know that this needs to happen, but y'all know how things happen in the state of Connecticut, right? So these are the folks who have the power to say yes and to say no. Um, you'll see the governor, um, the Senate president, and the Speaker of the House, three men, um, three white men, right, like I ultimately sit in the room and make most decisions about what happens to everyone in the state. So it's extremely important that we um, demonstrate our power and lobby them. Um, you'll also see some other um, leadership and um, the chairs of the um, different uh, uh, committees that will need to get bills passed through. I think what is important for um, members of SVP to understand, you know, given our strategic vision and strategic plan and the fact that we're focused on, like, if you look at this as a funnel, right, like we're highly focused on early childhood education and highly focused on workforce development, which is good, right? This isn't a or, this is a both and. There are some critical things happening in the middle of that in the K-12 system. So as we invest in early childhood education, those babies one day are going to go to schools. And we have to make sure that all the gains that we make when they're young are, con are continue to be maintained and they continue to thrive in a K-12 edu um, education system that sets them up for college and career. Um, so I would say like this is highly aligned with the strategic focus of SVP and many of you and your professional and personal lives. Um, we'll open up for questions now, but just really quickly, like what's something immediate you can do? We told you all of these statistics, all of these numbers, we talked about the challenge and I'll put this in the chat as well. Um, but 
there is power in numbers and please do not underestimate how important it is from your for your legislator to hear from you. Too often I see people talking to the wrong people. These legislators respond to their constituents, people who vote for them. Um, so one immediate thing you can do, and we'll talk about some others, if you go to faithacts.org slash act, um, there's a populated way for you to um, spit in your information and immediately contact your legislator legislator to support this bill so that we can make sure we get it across the finish line by the end of this legislative session. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Mark, do you want to open us up for discussion and questions? Yeah, I will. Thank you so much, uh, Sabir and Jamila. You know, really, uh, uh, thank you for your leadership. Um, I, I wanted to just kind of start off the questions and then, you know, just uh, open it up to everyone. One thing that um, might come up, uh, just uh, might be a useful point of clarification, is the the current, as I understand it, the way that the educational cost sharing formula works, there are targets that won't be re you know, reached until some point in the future, 2029, whatever the year is. Uh, meanwhile, as you pointed out, you know, we're in a state of crisis, you know, where students are struggling to recover from the effects of the pandemic and school districts are on the edge of this, you know, fiscal cliff where they are may have to lay off teachers, counselors, paraprofessionals. I guess my question is kind of, if we believe as a state, because we've already passed it, that this is the right policy to change the way in which we're funding schools, how can one justify waiting seven more years to reach the targets for that the ECS, you know, kind of bill is kind of laid out. So thanks for that question, Mark. I think, how can one justify? Um, when I think one of the problems, and it, Jamila and I have both talked about this, is the separation of where has really good schools and re a really great education for kids and where it doesn't. And I think the the headline that you see and the one that's always talked about by um, some leaders is the fact that we are third best in the country. And because of how much resources is already within the system, it justifies the fact that the phase in is the way to go and people already have enough money. But what's missing, and I think Jamila talked about this a little bit, is the separate is the difference between the districts with the most resources and the districts with that don't have those resources. And the I think for for, from my perspective and from this coalition's perspective, it's an issue about morality. If we believe that education is a great equalizer, if we believe that education is the only way for a child who's born in poverty to be able to transform their lives and break cycles of generational poverty, then we invest in kids and we invest in them early and ensure that they have the resources that they need to be successful. So the question there is, do we as a state believe that? Do we think that young people, students of color, poor students should have the resources that they need to be successful? And sometimes I think we are, I think we're challenging that question, which doesn't seem like that's where we are. I don't think that's the intention of the policy. I think the policy was made with the best intentions. And when we were in strained fiscal times, but right now we're not. So I think it, we really, there is money. We have a we have a four billion dollar surplus. We have just recently in, extended how much money we can put into the rainy day fund from fifteen percent to eighteen percent, which is saying to our young people, saying to our black and brown students, we would rather save this money for a future time than invest in you today. And I think that's just a morality issue that we're facing, and I think. This is what leadership looks like, right? The leadership of like at the highest level of the state, we're not seeing the investment in young people to say that we think that you too should be able to have that education system that's third best in the country. Jamila? Oh, when you ask questions like this, Mark. Um... <laughs> Because I don't want to, and like, excuse my French, but like, I don't want to give a bullshit answer, right? And so like, and this keeps me up at night because I don't understand why um, because of what I see every day. Um, I don't know if people know or want to know how bad things are. Um, I don't know if people understand 
that like there are there are families that are we're very proximate to um that are like am i going to fight for my food or my freedom today there are schools i you know i was talking to a um an educator at a school and you know she said she had a student come into school elementary school student who just witnessed his um, father commit suicide at the kitchen table in front of him. And she doesn't have a para in the classroom and they don't have a so social worker or a school psychologist. And so she's like, and she's also a 30 year educator that is saying that she wants to retire and she would never advise anyone to go into teaching right now. Um, and I'm gonna be honest, we've shared those stories with the governor. We've shared those stories with legislative leadership. And I'm seeing people decide time and time again, two things. One, that money is more important than kids, right? So like the, the numbers and like where our bottom line is and what we're saving is more important than saving lives. Um, I'm also seeing kids being used as a negotiation and bargaining chip. So like if, if you've seen the governor's proposed budget, um, it doesn't do a lot for poor people. Um, flat funding in education, um, disinvestment in housing, et cetera. Um, and what is happening now is that like, it, it, it politically makes sense for him, you know, he's about to go into negotiation with the Senate and the, and the House. So it makes sense for him to not, from a you know political standpoint to like not put everything out there so that he can negotiate and get some things that he wants. I think the challenge with that is like we're talking about real lives. And then the other challenge is for folks who want to blame the governor, which is me sometimes, I will name that. Um my senator has been in power and like it, you know in the Senate as long as I've been alive, right? And so like this isn't a Republican versus Democrat issue. Um, Connecticut is weird, right? Like we are like, we are, there's so much that we can do right now immediately. And so like, it literally doesn't make sense that people aren't toppling over and jumping over themselves to make this happen. One other quick thing I'll say is like the rebuttals are like accountability. There are already measures in place um, to hold districts more accountable for how they spend money and how they hire teachers. Um, the state hasn't been compelled to use those levers. And then the other thing um, that we're, you know, noticing in terms of some of the opposition to our bill is it includes schools of choice. And we got to talk about that. Like the fact that, you know, people are saying that black and brown kids in schools of choice that are outperforming their districts don't deserve equitable, equitable funding as a problem. I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, you already answered one. I, I was going to ask you the the pushback question that people oftentimes ask, which is, um, can will increased spending alone solve the serious, you know, educational disparities in the state? You may want to just, you know, kind of comment on put it in put the spending issue into context as to why it's important, even though it may not be it's not the only kind of thing, obviously. Yeah, I think I just to add there, I think when we talk about accountability, it's really important to think about accountability based on what, right? So when there is already not enough money in the system, it's hard to then say to some of these districts, I need you to do better. Totally understand that like there's a lot that needs to be done to ensure that the adults in the system are serving the kids that they're supposed to serve and doing it to the best of their ability. But I do think like it's not necessarily an either or conversation, it's a both and, right? Like we do need to hold the system accountable, but we also need to ensure that we are funding students based on their need and not just these arbitrary line items that somebody decided or people with power decided that wasn't necessarily connected to the needs of students. Um, and to be honest, we are having the accountability conversation at the same time. I think when you we see how much federal dollars were spent um, in what was infused into the system, what we've looked at and we've it's all, the majority of those resources are being spent on essential services. And what that tells us is we don't have enough state funding to support students. New Haven, for example, while it might, you know, there's lots of 
pluses and pros and cons with New Haven and what they've done, but in some schools, they've been able to reduce class sizes by half. That There is a direct correlation to see whether a student is going to be able to be successful. There's a difference between having 20 students in the classroom versus 33 students in the classroom. And that's the difference with one educator versus two educators. And that's how there are some districts that be, that's been able to spend the federal funding is to reduce their class sizes and helping students in the ways that they need. There's mental health supports that, that was put into law last year. All of that was funded with federal, with federal resources. If those go away, way, you'll see behavioral techs be pulled out of schools. You'll see extra social workers be pulled out of schools. And those are things that we know will be directly connected to better outcomes. And that's connected to accountability. So if you can't, if you're not, if you are already not spending enough money, you then can't say to the system, you don't have enough money, but then I also want you to do these other things that you, you know, we do believe that you should be doing. So that's just the one thing in accountability. And we are having those conversations. And parallel to our bill that's running this year, there's Senate Bill 1 that's going to be addressing accountability and we are in those conversations and making sure that it's being done in a way that is not it can't be punitive but it really needs to address the system um, meeting the needs of the students that they're serving and not just the adults in the buildings i i um wanted to get back to um and then i'll open it up to everybody uh the fiscal uh, question because uh, many people are aware that um, at the beginning of the session, legislative session, the governor and the legislative leadership agreed upon extending kind of the uh, fiscal, so called fiscal guardrails, um, which kind of creates financial constraints um, on, on the budget uh, on increasing education and social spending. Um, can you explain how that may affect your bill and whether there's still room? to kind of achieve the level of funding that you've laid out, even with those kind of fiscal guardrails? So, I mean, I will just say flat out, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's what we should have done, but that's what, you know, politicians are elected to do what they need to do. Um, because what it does is it creates less resources in the system and there's less money to be spent. But there is still an additional $650 million that can be spent this year. And the legislature and the governor has to decide where they're going to invest those resources. There has always been room within the spending cap to do this bill. There has always been enough money to fund education. We, the, and by we, I mean the legislature has just decided not to do it because of competing priorities. As I said before, education is a great equalizer. It's the only way to transform systems of generational poverty that is directly connected to, you know, the inputs and how you're going to be able to solve, solve problems for long term. If we fund education, we have less reliance on the social safety net. If we're funding education, we have less reliance. We're thinking less about kids going into juvie and, and spending on the criminal justice system. So if we do believe that education is the way to solve many of our systemic issues, we would invest in education. The guardrails, I think, you know, Politicians have to do what politicians have to do in order to continue to, you know, meet the needs of their constituents. I do think that keeping our state in good fiscal health is a good thing. I don't think it should happen at the expense of students. And there is enough money to do this. So it, it the idea about competing priorities, um, I don't believe that. I do think if it's a priority and legislators and the governor want to get it done, they will get it done. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat line, and then I'll also encourage people to raise their hands. Um, do Connecticut charter schools receive the same funding per student that the public schools do or the non-charter public schools do? So historically, they have not, which has been a huge issue. Um, so in the state of Connecticut, um, there are two types of charter schools. There's a state charter and a local charter school. Um, there's only one local charter school in the state of Connecticut, um, and that's Elm City Montessori in New Haven. It has to be approved by the State Board of Education and also um, the local Board of Education. So there's an opportunity for, get, for them to get some additional local funds. Um, but historically, um, the way that our charter laws were in the state charter school was only able to access um, state funds. And, um, you know, for everything before 2021, um, it was a, a separate line item 
um, a separate way of funding. And not only were you seeing inequities between urban districts and suburban districts, for example, but then within the urban district, um, the charter was often getting like close to $5,000 left. I, I think previous to this um, work, it was the, the height that it reached was like 11.5, um, uh, 11,500. Uh, dollars. And so now um, what we've done in terms of changing um, the formula and the law previous to this year was making sure that the weighted student funding from the state is also applied to the charter. Um, so they're getting that weight um, for concentrated poverty and for poverty and for English language learners now. So it has um, drastically increased state funding for charter schools that overwhelmingly serve students of color um, and low-income students, and many serve English language learners um, in the communities that they're in as well. Um, what this doesn't do is change the fact that charters do, still do not get or have access to local funding. Um, so that property tax, um, and even in cities like New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford that um, don't have as much of a, you know, um, a property tax base, um, they're still getting that um, additional funds from the local municipality. So this does not address that. And so I think on average, just to add to that, uh, depending on the student population that you're serving as a charter, which is the weighted formula is like, it's good because it provides equity, but on average, each the per pupil increase at the end of this per, per student in charters is between four and $5,000, depending on the need of the student, which would be the largest increase in charter school funding that Connecticut has seen probably in over 10 years. So it drastically shifts how charters have been funded, but the because it's connected to the weights, depending on where the charter school is, it might just, the, there's a variation on exactly how much each school will get. But um, it, I think it, for the first time, at least in Connecticut, we're no longer saying to kids who exercise choice and go to the schools that outperform their districts, that you are not worthy of the same amount of funding that other students are. are. So I think this is just, it's a big shift in how we've always funded charters. And I think we, you know, obviously there's issues around facilities and all other, all types of other things that charters don't have access to, but this is, I think, a big step in the right direction there. And I know we're saying all this with like a straight face because we're in the thick of the war at the Capitol, but like, that's like a huge deal and it's very historic, right? So like it's charters have seen their largest increase over the past decade. Um, and we're doing it in a way in which we're not hurting traditional public schools, but also making sure that charters are funded more equitably as they should be. Um, there's a question in the chat uh, from Wendy Foster. Is there an alliance of business leaders in Connecticut advocating for education funding? So, uh, so CBIA, they are supportive of the bill. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure if beyond CBIA and the work that they have done support to support us, if there has been essentially, we've met with, so the coalition itself has met with lots of different business leaders. We met with the head, head of Hartford Healthcare, met with the head of Stanley Black and Decker. Um, I, what I would say, and I can say this to this group of individuals, I think that's missing from the work that we're doing. I think the, like those of us who are advocates, like Jamila and I, we work with parents, we work with students, we, um, the coalition works with educators. What's missing is making the business argument as to why it's really important to do this. As I said earlier, Lego is leaving Connecticut because of workforce needs. I think a highly educated student population leads to better workforce outcomes, but we, it would be great to have a really strong um, message from the business community that this bill is incredibly important. Funding education is incredibly important for the betterment of our state and for um, like long-term sustainability for around workforce needs and business development. Um, so I do know that we've had meetings with um, business leaders, but as far as a group that's connected and working on this legislation specifically, I we don't have that at the moment. And I think Jamila and I would be happy to talk with anyone who's interested in putting that together so we could have those conversations because it's really, really important. And that, that may be an area where there could be, where SVP could help also. So, um, but it's really clear, I would say, you know, um, I wear a hat of, of chairing the Governor's Workforce Council that, um, you know, we have a labor shortage, you know, uh, 110,000 
open jobs. And, you know, one of the biggest concerns on the part of the business community is not being able to find people uh, who are ready for work, who have the right skill sets, and also kind of the right, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, from an educational standpoint and, and social standpoint are, um, you know, prepared, you know, for the workplace. And so, um, and when you have a chronic absenteeism rate that Sabira talked about of 69% in Hartford and 50% in other urban schools districts, um, it's, it's really difficult uh, to meet the workforce needs in Connecticut. Um, question, next questions. Um, I'm seeing a question in the chat here uh, for Jamila. Um, other than uh, the advocacy effort uh, in the cities that you're working in, are you also pulling together school volunteers together from church members, um, you know, in, in reading, math, enrichment, mentoring? And do you have plans or desires to expand into other large centers around the state like Stanford, Norwalk, and Danbury? Mm. Um, yeah, so we are, um, we are the type of organization where we like to do a couple of things great. And so that's our good versus great. Like we feel like we can do a lot of things good, but we need to have be hyper focused to do a couple of things great. So we made a decision in our founding. We were founded by people in Bridgeport. So I literally sat in a church basement for a year, once a week, I think on a Monday night. Um, and we just dreamt up this organization. And we had to make really tough decisions about one, being a single issue organization. So only focused on education, not focused on any other issue, um, which I think could change in time, but not right now. Um, and then the other um, very difficult decision that we had to make was that we were not going to be a direct service organization. Um, so the volunteering and the tutoring, it's not that we would not um, ever do that, but that was not going to be our focus um, so that we could really lean in and focus on um, the systemic work and building power to actually do this work at the systems level um, to make that change. With that said, we do, um, I just got off the phone with um, Connecticut Center uh, for Children's Advocacy with their lawyers in New Haven, Hartford, and Bridgeport talking about special education and the fact that um, many IEPs um, are not being met. There's a ton of kids that are being um, suspended and um, you know could have a learning difference that hasn't been identified because there aren't enough um, uh, social workers and other case workers in the schools to identify kids. And so we're literally talking about doing a training for our people and for our parents because so many parents are going to um, PPT meetings alone and unarmed with the support and advocacy that we they need. And so we're literally talking about training pastors to be like PPT supports for students. So that's like an example of something that we would do. Um, another thing that happened in the pandemic in New Haven in particular, and I know folks on New Haven know this, um, from New Haven on this call know this, but um, New Haven was one of the larger urban districts that um, stayed remote. And there were there was really no place for kids to go. And so like before all of the funding came in, the federal funding, and I would see even even the philanthropic dollars came in, churches opened their doors and created learning hubs um, in their church basement so that kids could come and get the support that they needed through remote learning. And they kept their doors open. I think the challenge that we've seen is that both, I think like governments and schools really want to lean on churches when they're in need. But once that funding came in, like, honestly, like many of our churches were closed out. Um, so the majority of black and brown people in these communities, myself included, were vaccinated at their church in their church basement, right? So like, there's no issue with separation of church and state then. But it's sometimes it's very hard when you're pushing and advocating for changes in schools, you notice it's very difficult to get in those same schools. So those are some of the challenges that we're meeting in terms of like, we're, we wanna have a village approach. You don't have social workers in the school, like there aren't grandparents in the schools anymore. Let us come in and help support and work with the students. There are some schools that are really open to that, that we partner with, and there are some schools that aren't. Um, and in terms of our expansion across the state, um, I just don't think we know yet, right? And so I think a lot of that has to do with um, you know, we don't see success as like scaling. 
um, like being in a lot of places, but we're trying to go really deep in a few places. Um, but I, I, I hope that our work results in the opportunity to expand in other places in the state because I think we'll get more done and win for more kids. Um, Arden um, has been uh, has raised her hand. Arden Santana, do you want to ask your question? Hi. Um, did I unmute? Yes. Oops. Okay. It's a. Um, okay. Um, so I would like to respond to Wendy's um, inquiry about business organizations that may have aligned. Um, the closest thing we have to it right now is the New Haven Feder the New Haven Federation of Teachers Alliance with Recovery, Recovery for All, um, which is. Um, a town hall education initiative to, to bring the community, businesses, all factions who are concerned about the state of education together um, to do this work. Um, so you can you know, take a look at, at that um, collaboration. I think that's the closest thing we have right now. And then um, Jamila, I would like to request some time to um, meet with you and discuss further, particularly um, the work that you're interested in doing with parents. Um, we have to begin to educate them and um, get provide the advocacy around the parents to take a, um, more ownership in what's happening with the education system. Um, and I um, have been trained in a program called Raising Highly Capable Kids, actually out of um, Bridgeport with the Faith um, Faith Education and Acts Coalition there, um, a very heavy um, um Latino, Latinx population that is um, showing impressive um, turnout for uh, parents who want to take an active role and gain the tools and strategies they need to be more supportive in um, improving literacy and education rates and scores and grades and everything, just overall improvement of GPAs and their students just by getting the parents more um, involved in, in their role towards raising a highly capable child. Um, so I'd like to speak with you more about how can I help you with um, you know, the work you, you're um, beginning to do with the Center for Children's Advocacy um, and getting the word out to the pastors to tell their congregations um, and that be a way to access the parents. My first cohort, cohort is starting February 23rd, so that may not be enough time, um, but I do want to start a second one for the summer. So. That sounds great. great. I'm looking forward to connecting. Great. One, I, I think we have time for one last question, which Tom Cuser from WSHU asked, um, will the passage of the bill, HP 503, and the education funding provide enough to put the brakes on the exodus of teachers from districts in need and also encourage others to enter the profession? So I think I can take that question. One of the things that, so we are providing these resources to districts. What we will hope that they will do is similar to, as you have mentioned, what we've seen during the pandemic is we have seen lots of teachers in high need districts move to the suburbs because they're able to get a $20,000 sign-on bonus and also make significantly more money. So we would hope that districts would then use this money to invest in their educators. Um, on a something very similar to what, to the, not necessarily connected to funding, but some of the work that CONCAN does is directly connected to getting a more diverse workforce and kind of really figuring out how to get more teachers into the classroom and quickly getting them certified to be able to tackle the teacher shortage. So we would hope that districts would use this money in the right way. But we're also working with the state to create incentives for young people to become educators and create systems that can, uh, easily transition someone from career into the classroom without having to necessarily go through teacher prep. Connecticut, there are 21 different hoops you have to jump through if you want to become an educator in Connecticut, which is much different from many other states. So we want to simplify the process. We want to modernize the process and we want to make it a system that is better and more diverse and, and like more reflective of what student needs are and reflective of the student population today. I know, so one of the reasons why the Connecticut Education Association has signed on to be a supporter of this is because they want to see their teachers be paid more and they see this as more money to the district and that being able to be connected to educators. Another quick fact is paraeducators in Connecticut make $25,000 a year. 
that is not okay. So we also hope that districts will then use these resources and invest in their power educators so they can have a better living wage compared to others. Um, you know, I think there each year there's complementing policy that goes along with resources. So we wanna make sure that we're continuing to have those conversations about getting more educators into the classroom and trying to figure out how we can create, you know, just create systems that support and help to retain teachers, not just get them into the classroom. Because I think what we're seeing is lots of young teachers come in and they don't stay because they don't feel like they're supported in the profession. Can, can right. I just add one, one quick thing there, just to put a pin in something Sabira said. Paras are holding our classrooms together in urban districts, and they're overwhelmingly um, Black and Brown women um, who should be teaching and very much are, but haven't had the resources and the support that they need to pass the test to become a certified educator. And so, like, I think just pinning the question of what Sabira just said, like, the money gets us half the way there. We have the pool to actually fund and, and support teachers, but like some drastic changes need to happen at the district level in terms of like our leaderships and superintendents and their appetite for those that level of change. And also um, I think board of eds, whether they're appointed or a hybrid working with the teacher unions and other organizations as well, and like Sabira, et cetera, um, to make sure these alternative routes to certification stick and that we're placing these women who are carrying the load. And the same thing is happening in early childhood education, by the way, um, we're placing them in the position that they deserve to be in. And so like, if we don't see those policy shifts and that like intense leadership an action happening on the local level, a lot more money will go in and it'll get lost into central office. So like, this is part one, um, I think of a two prong plan. And so like, we not only need you all to like reach out to your legislators to get these funds, but we're also gonna need you to hold your legislators accountable, legislators accountable. And if you live in or work in a district um, that is a high needs district, we need to make sure you are also going to the local board of ed meetings and making these demands as well. Well, I wanna thank uh, Jamila and Sabira so much for um, your tireless work and leadership around these issues. Um, and um, I also want to encourage everybody that's on this call and to tell your friends that this is a winnable issue. This is something that is going to happen in the next few months. Uh, there is a lot of legislative support for uh, the coalition here. And it's going to, this is one of the things that's going to be negotiated in this year's budget. So, you know, um, the coalition needs your support. And I just want to thank you guys for uh, for your great work. Um, there are, um, I also want to thank everybody for their time today. And you'll see in here, um, if you want to become part of SVP, uh, you're welcome. And uh, you can con contact any of us, um, you know, in terms of the, with the email addresses listed above. So, uh, we welcome you uh, to SVP and again, kind of thank Jamila and Sabira for their uh, leadership in the program today. So everybody have a great afternoon.